morning. Welcome to the third lecture of this week one of the ongoing course on understanding and reducing greenhouse gas emissions with a focus on scope 1 and 2 emission reduction through building design and construction. We are going through this lecture 3. Now, prior to this in the previous two lectures what we have covered is we have kind of developed our understanding of what sustainability and sustainable development would mean and then we looked at the historic overview of how the discussion around sustainable development ha happened across the world. We looked at how the world came together and adopted first formulated and then adopted an agenda 21 then followed by Millennium Development Goals MDGs and then Sustainable Development Goals SDGs which are ongoing. So, they we are currently in the process of trying to reach the targets which have been set under Sustainable Development Goal. Now, by this time a lot of you might be questioning that we are here to study about greenhouse gas emissions and scope 1 and scope 2 emissions and then learning how to cut them down. Why at all are we you know discussing about sustainable development. Now, the whole idea is that we cannot directly jump to the final step of this whole process. We have to understand why historically did we start talking about greenhouse gas emissions in the first place, where all did it all uh, start. So, this is what we are doing, we are trying to understand the history of it, we are trying to weave the story of it and then we will come to this main agenda the discussion of this particular course which is around greenhouse gas emissions and then we will learn to uh, cut them down through architecture through building design that is what the aim of this particular course is. So, now after we have learned about sustainable development goals we have already identified that goal 13 of sustainable development goals SDGs very clearly for the first time started talking about climate change. Now, by this time what had happened was that we were understanding that there is a lot of development which is happening, the humans are going forward, there are impacts of those developments on human health and well being, on economy, on environment, environment was one which was greatly hit and of course, human health and well being was too. Now, we were gradually moving this discussion forward and more and more newer issues which were of greater concern in the modern times in the contextual times they started to come up as we moved from agenda 21 to MDG to SDG and there we saw that there is a specific goal on climate change. Now, this is what we are talking almost in the present and we realize that climate change is real. Now, why is climate change happening and how can we curb that led to the discussion on greenhouse gas emissions. So, this is what we are going to see in today's lecture where we are going to talk about we will introduce you to climate change. How do we really know whether climate change is real? Is it just you know scientists or some group of people talking about climate change or is it real? So, what are the indicators if it is real then history of action on climate change a quick recap on how discussion about climate change continued to happen. So, again this is not something which is which is very new this has been happening from a long time now climate change is not new either. And then we will quickly talk about the SDG goal 13 which is again on climate action. So, quickly understanding what is climate change. So, climate change basically refers to a long term shift in temperature or weather pattern. And these shifts by the way they can be because of some natural phenomena, terrestrial phenomena happening such as sun's activity, there are changes in sun's activity, there could be large volcanic uh, eruptions or things like that. But largely in the last almost 200 years ever since industrial revolution took place closer to that time. So, we have seen that human activity what we are doing on this planet is the main driver of climate climate change. It is largely now we have come to a consensus that the climate change today is actually being driven by human activity. Earlier there was a lot of conflict when scientists and you know uh, ecologists they started to discuss that why is climate change happening or if it is happening. So, a lot of scientists argued that this could be because of the distance between sun and earth our relative position the sun's activity and a lot of things, but now 
over the last 50 years, there has been a clear consensus that this climate change that we are witnessing now is because of human activity. So, there is no ambiguity, there is no discussion anymore on this that human activity is probably one of the reasons, but today it is clear that it is the main driver of this climate change that is happening. Now, if we are talking about climate change, often you know when uh, as a common uh, talk we talk about climate change, we kind of place it synonymous to global warming. Everybody when they say oh there is a lot of climate change happening and in almost the same tone they will say that oh there is a lot of warming happening, global warming happening. So, they are synonymous in common uh, understanding terms, but they are two different phenomena, not different interrelated. They are part of the same set of problem that we are talking about, but climate change is more than global warming, but global warming is apparently one of the primary reasons for a lot of other climate changes happening. Now, if we get to the root of the climate change, why is climate change happening? What are the cause, what is the cause of climate change? all the causes that we will we will kind of understand note the primary route is burning of fossil fuels in the last 200 years uh, two centuries ever since industrial revolution took place very clearly we have seen that our industrial activities have grown up our uh, mobility uh, requirements have grown up our requirements for consuming electricity our dependence on machines and almost every activity that we are going on with in our uh, daily lives, it requires burning of fossil fuel and we have been burning the fossil fuels at a pace much faster in the history of our entire evolution probably. And that is the primary reason for climate change because we clearly understand the relationship, we burn more fossil fuels which are largely hydrocarbons which are buried under the earth. We bring them out, we burn them, combustion releases more and more of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and that is the primary reason why global warming is happening and why eventually climate change is happening. So, the root cause is burning of fossil fuels and why are we burning fossil fuels? We are burning fossil fuels to generate power, we need a lot of electricity to survive today. We cannot imagine a day in our lives without electricity which is on power. Yes, we are gradually uh, you know moving towards the alternative uh, sources of energy like solar, wind, water, hydro. So, we are looking at those options, but still the largest share of this electricity in the entire world comes from conventional fuels, the fossil fuel, burning of fossil fuels and that is the primary reason for burning the fossil fuels. The second is manufacturing of goods. Today we have way more industries and the rate of production is much higher than what it has ever been. So, we are manufacturing goods like anything. Industries they require huge amounts of energy to run. It could be electricity which is in turn burning fossil fuels or it could be direct burning of fuel such as gas or oil or coal anything. So, we are looking at burning of fossil fuels for manufacturing goods and then using transportation for everything we use transportation. The world has shrunk, it has become so much smaller today. Today I am in India and tomorrow I might be in United States things have become much easier, transportation has increased, has become better and the opportunities for everybody to travel have become much better. We are talking about promoting uh, tourism, we are talking about promoting the inter intercultural relationships and everything, all that requires transporting people from one place to the other and also when we manufacture goods, we want to have bigger market. The world is a market, fair trade and open trade has also facilitated that which means the goods have to be transported as well. So, uh, earlier you know the mango would be a fruit of Indian subcontinent and now you go wherever in the world you will find mango being uh, you know sold on the uh, at the outlets. So, this is what requires transportation and transportation again runs on fossil fuels. All major public uh, transportation systems are run on fossil fuels. 
we are again looking for alternatives, but that is one major consumer of fossil fuels and effectively a contributor to climate change. Then I will come to the first one later, but uh, the second one is producing food. If you remember in the previous lecture, I was talking about a huge population, more number of people eating more, consuming more and for that we have to produce more goods and excreting more, producing more waste. That was the problem that we kind of summarized and the world is a more populous world than ever. So, the population at its is at its highest peak today than ever in the history. So, this, this requires so many people to be fed, we have to grow food and food producing and processing is an energy consuming exercise. It might not be directly consuming uh, fuels in certain parts of the world if people are still depending upon the traditional methods of cultivation and agriculture farming, but in the developed world they are highly dependent upon again machines to do all the jobs that requires fuel, fossil fuel and again produces greenhouse gases and then again the same problem consuming too much. The world, the industries are producing a lot of clothes and so the fashion has to change because if I have to buy a new fashion, if I have to buy clothes only for necessity, I will not buy, but if I have to buy for fashion, then I will buy. So, the fashion changes and then my wardrobe remains full. Every year I might be adding 10 new dresses to my wardrobe while none of it is actually necessary because my wardrobe is already full. So, this is also a consumer driven society that we are having today and that is another cause for indirectly you know step wise if we will calculate for climate change and global warming. Now, these were the reasons which will increase climate change and global warming, but the sixth reason which I have written here as causes of climate change is cutting down forests. Now, forests if we have a lot of forests, they will absorb all this extra greenhouse gas that is being produced by this all these five activities. Unfortunately, so all these five are positive contributors to global warming and eventually climate change and this one is a negative inversely proportional. So, if we have more forests, so while on one hand we might be producing more carbon dioxide greenhouse gases, but if we have a lot of forest to absorb it, it will kind of uh, balance itself out. But what we are actually doing, we are further reducing our sink, we are cutting down our forest, so they are not able to absorb the carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases that are further causing the damage. So, together all of these activities and there may be many more, you might be able to find out more reasons and causes, these are the primary ones, the largest shareholders of this climate change. So, this is what we are talking about and if the climate change happens, a lot of catastrophic impacts are going to be there. Today we might be witnessing some of them, but not in that severity as they might eventually lead us to, but we are talking about hotter climate, temperatures becoming higher, more severe storms and floods and droughts in different parts of the world depending upon their geography and availability of resources, warming oceans implying loss of species both on land and water and eventually not enough food for people to survive. So, it is gradually going to decline for us, our population, human population is further going to decline because of the lack of availability of resources and major health risks. So, very briefly I have put it, we will go over it in detail, but before we do that, we will look at the indicators of climate change. So, how do we really know that climate change is for real? So, what US Environmental Protection Agency, US EPA has done is they have put around 50 climate change indicators under these six categories and they have tried to kind of relate and identify the changes that have happened over time and which can be related to climate change. So, this, these six categories in which they have been able to put these 50 climate change indicators are greenhouse gases, weather and climate, oceans, snow and ice, 
health and society and ecosystems. I am going to go over it very quickly, but let us quickly look at some of the indicators under each of this category. So, greenhouse gases, this particular category of indicators, it characterizes emissions from the major greenhouse gases re resulting from human activities. The concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere and how emissions and concentrations have changed over time. So, they talk about the greenhouse gas emissions in US in particular and globally too, atmospheric concentrations and climate forcing. Under weather and climate, they talk about observed changes in temperature, precipitations, storms, floods and droughts. So, how seasonal temperature is varying, how peaks of temperatures highest and lowest, how are they changing over years, heat waves, the precipitation pattern whether it is increasing or decreasing in and also globally not just in US. Cyclone activity, hurricanes, how these major climate events are happening, flooding, drought. So, all of this has been put under this category of weather and climate. And then oceans, oceans are so important and they are so uh, relevant, significant for balancing the climate and also they are an indicator that what is the temperature of the ocean. So, ocean heat, how much can it hold? So, along with forests, oceans are also one entity which can hold, absorb a lot of these gases, they can hold a lot of heat. So, but if a lot of heat is being held in sea, in the ocean waters, it has further damages, it has further changes. So, how the impact of climate change can be measured is through the heat that is contained in the ocean, which is reflected by the temperature of average temperature of ocean, sea surface temperature. Surfaces are always warmer than the deeper parts of the sea. So, how the sea surface temperature is changing, how the sea level is changing, because if the temperatures increase, there is more and more water which is melting from the glaciers, from the snow caps, ice caps and they are being brought to the sea and overall the sea levels would be rising. We will see them in detail, but that is one another indicator, loss of land, loss of coast, uh, coastal flooding and also acidity in the oceans is another indicator. The next category is snow and ice and under that we are talking about melting of ice caps. Arctic sea ice, Antarctic sea ice, ice sheets, glaciers, Arctic glaciers, lake ice, snowfalls and snow covers and how these are changing is what we will see in this. And finally, health and society, all of this has a direct impact on the human health and well-being. So, how people are impacted by the climate change and there are indicators such as health, heat related deaths heat related illnesses, cold related deaths and illnesses, also residential energy use. If there is excessive heating, excessive heat in the atmosphere outside, we will be consuming more energy for cooling our interiors and vice versa. If it is excessively cold outside, we will be consuming more energy to keep our interiors warm. So, residential energy use is a direct indicator of climate change. We are talking about different types of diseases, changing patterns of seasons, length of individual seasons and uh, their impact on plants, the crop cultivation and all of that. So, these are the broad six categories. Uh, okay, the last category uh, is ecosystems and he, we are talking about indicators such as wildfires. We are talking about indicators such as streams flow the temperatures of lakes and the movement of migratory species of birds and animals, they are more sensitive to temperatures and they move with temperatures. So, these are the indicators that we are covering under the ecosystems. We are not going to go over detail in detail over all of these indicators, but we have to be conscious that these are the indicators, some of the indicators, the most important ones which scientists have identified out of these 50 odd indicators. So, this is a list of 10 major change indicators that scientists have identified and we will quickly see how the world has been changing in the last 150, 200 years 
uh, on each of these indicators. So, out of the 50, the indicators that have been identified air temperatures over land, air temperatures over oceans, Arctic sea ice, glaciers, sea levels, humidity, ocean heat, sea surface temperature, snow, snow caps and the earth's lower atmospheric temperature. Now, if you look at the trend, you can see clearly here that from 1850 to 200 almost 150 years, the average temperature. So, this was the normal of 1850 and we have now this is uh, you know uh, if, if we are talking about 2021, we are almost at 1.2 here. So, there has been an increase of 1.2 degree centigrade in the world. So, we are talking about land surface temperature here and we then talk about air temperatures over oceans that has also increased. So, from uh, that is again 0.8 around. So, it was below normal and these what you are seeing here are the different models. Now, we have to understand that while we can measure temperatures in a place overall the earth's temperature measurement is actually a a formula driven thing. We cannot really measure earth's temperature and average temperature, it has to be calculated. So, there are a lot of different models using which we can calculate the average temperatures of uh, land, of earth, of air over sea, which is not an easy job. The models have to be created to predict that. How good fitting the models are will uh, give us different varying results, but if you look at that. Uh, this particular graph, there are 5 such models which have been considered here and all these 5 models are very close to each other with some variation uh, degree of variation here, but we are talking about 0.4 to minus 0 0.4 to plus 0 0.4 centigrade which is again closely a change of 1 degree centigrade here. So, this is air temperatures over oceans. Now, if you look at arctic sea ice that is the cover, it is quite uh, alarming. We are seeing this is in 10 to the power 6 square kilometers that we are talking about and this has reduced from peaking around 1970s or even if we take around 1950s from 8.5 to 4.5 here. Okay. Even if we take 5 to be on a better side, we are talking about 3.5 into 10 to the power 6 square kilometers shrunk. So, arctic sea ice, this is only arctic sea ice which has reduced by these many square kilometers over just 100 years or probably less than that. This is really alarming and where has all that ice gone? It has gone to our oceans and seas, it has gone to our rivers. So, sometimes the flooding must have happened, sometimes the you know uh, droughts might have happened, but all of this water eventually would accumulate in our in our oceans and that is further causing to the uh, leading to the sea level rise. We are talking about glaciers melting and all of you must have seen those really terrifying videos of the entire patch of glacier breaking off melting into the into the ocean into the sea water. This is what we are talking about again. So, uh, it is happening at a much faster pace and uh, if IPCC report is to be believed. Again, these are models, these are scientific models. One cannot really calculate accurately that when would the entire glacier melt. There are a lot of parameters, thousands of parameters which are not just human driven, they are nat nature driven too, which will determine, which will decide when the glacier will totally disappear or if, if the reversal is going to happen. But there are certain reports that indicate that by 2100, a lot of these glaciers would have uh, melted and most of the water from these glaciers would have accumulated in the sea causing for the sea level rise. So, this is what we are talking about as sea level rise. Now, here if you are seeing we are talking about this is minus and from 1850s, 1870s a minus 190 mm to a plus 70 mm this is a huge difference. We are talking about 250 mm of sea, sea level rise, which is again alarming. Now, it might not seem very uh, alarming or terrifying to us people who are living in the mainland, but especially for people who are living on the 
uh, coastal areas and we will come to that the impacts of development when we talk about in lecture 5, we will see how this sea level rise has impacted people. There are certain island nations such as Mauritius and others which are on the brink of becoming submerged if there is a total rise of around 1 meter of the sea level and it is happening very fast, it is, it is real. The tides are entering their, their cities and they have to create embankments and they have to create protection walls, but for how long? We cannot have an island which is at a level lower than the average sea level, the sea water is some way or the other or sometime or the other going to submerge this entire city and that entire nation for that matter and that is what certain nations fear. Humidity is increasing and what is the impact of humidity increase? It makes the environment uncomfortable for us and we require more and more energy to make our indoors more comfortable. So, this is again very important indicator that uh, you know increase of humidity. Next is ocean heat content, I have already talked about what ocean heat content would mean that how much uh, heat is contained in the ocean which is indicated by the temperature that it has and here it has been measured by the uh, heat content that is contained in the ocean in joules and that is also tremendously increasing. So, we can see the sharp rise in the uh, ocean heat uh, content. Again sea surface temperature which is directly dependent upon the temperature above sea, over the sea of air and average temperature or of earth. So, we can see that the sea surface temperature is also growing. So, this is again a uh, difference of around plus 0 0.8 degree centigrade. So, we are roughly talking about an increase of 1 to 1.2 uh, degree centigrade in this period. Again the snow is uh, decreasing which is not, we are not talking about the ice caps or glaciers here, we are talking about areas which receive snow. So, what we are talking about is that areas which earlier used to remain covered in snow, certain countries are not having enough of snowfall now. So, that is what we are talking about and the earth's lower atmospheric temperature is increasing which is what all of us are worried about and this is something that directly uh, impacts everything. Now, this all this change that I am talking about and if you looked at the graphs carefully, we are talking about this change over a period of 100 to 150 years, which means that we have been noting it down, we have been conscious about it. So, it is not that okay in the last 50 years that suddenly the temperatures increase that we have opened our eyes we have been very very conscious to this climate change happening and it is over the last 150 200 years that we have observed it. And so, there have been several people who have raised their voices, who have raised their concerns over this changing uh, climate and the reasons for it primarily human activity. Now, as I mentioned earlier initially when the discussion started there was no consensus over the impact of human activity on climate change or whether human activity was the main driver. In fact, if we look at the history of climate change, the first calculation of greenhouse effect actually took place in 1896, almost 100 years after the industrial revolution took place and that too was kind of an incidental uh, research. So, the discussion around that time was on whether we are nearing an ice age. So, the discussion the models that were uh, developed and uh, it was the first scientist was Langley and his observation was that if we reduce the carbon dioxide by half and in fact, he was talking about the, his observations were on increased infrared observation uh, absorption where moon rays they will pass through the atmosphere at a low angle and then they will encounter more carbon dioxide and uh, related uh, phenomena. In 1870, 1896, Swante Arrhenius, he developed a model, he used Langley's observations only and he was arguing about what happens if the carbon dioxide emission is reduced by half or if it is doubled. So, what happens? For the first time, if it was uh, the model revealed that if it is reduced by half, it would be uh, bringing us closer to the ice age, but if it is doubled then it would be 
resulting in global warming. So, that was the first discussion around 1896 and we are talking about 130 odd years uh, from then uh, we are here today. So, a lot of discussion has happened on climate change. Now, if we uh, talk about the uh, important climatic dates throughout the history, we are talking about 1896 when for the first time Swan Thearhenius, a Swedish scientist, he published the idea of burning fossil fuels for adding more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere because we wanted to push the ice age further. So, at that time in 1896 the discussion was on if we are nearing the, uh, the ice age. So, how should we kind of uh, stop that reduce that was by burning more fossil fuel which implied that if we release more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere there will be more absorption of heat and there will be heated atmosphere pushing further the ice age. However, and again as I said that all these models th are actually models, theoretical models. So, we would never know in real where we are as far as ice age is concerned. So, ice age did not happen, we still do not know if we are nearing ice age or not, but for sure a lot of carbon dioxide has been released in the atmosphere and the global warming surely has happened. So, in 1903 there were first marked realizations that the North Atlantic region of earth had significantly warmed. We are talking about not just even 10 years from that discussion by Swante Arrhenius. In 1950s to 1960 GS calendar's theory of earth warming due to greenhouse gases was proven feasible by Keeling's measurements. So, it took another 50 years to actually experimentally prove and validate that the earth is actually warming due to greenhouse gases which are carbon dioxide and several other gases which absorb heat the particles of which absorb heat. In 1970 first clean air act was passed in the congress and for the first time first earth day was celebrated. We quickly saw the history of sustainable development and there also we were talking about these significant uh, events such as celebration of first earth day. In 1988 for the first time we marked the hottest summer on record and triggered models of carbon dioxide emissions. So, then people started because it was such a hot summer in 1988 and from then on probably every second year we have been having the hottest summer ever. So, 1988 for the first time we had the hottest summer ever and then again two years later we had the hottest summer ever. So, 1988 record was broken and then 1992 and like that and till date we are only having the increased heat in summers, increased severity of summers. 2001 IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change established a clear consensus on severe human induced climate change. So, till that time for almost 100 years we even argued, we continue to argue if the climate change that is happening is because of human activity or not. So, despite having so many models developed despite having so much of discussion we were still not on consensus whether all this warming that is happening is because of human uh, actions. 2001 IPCC formally recognized that the climate change that we are having is actually human induced it is because of human activity and 2020 again you know 20 years from then when we recognize that the climate change and the global warming is because of human activity and we also formulated MDGs and SDGs in 2020, we are here in 2023, even by 2020 we realize that not much positive has happened as far as climate change is concerned. The world is increasingly becoming warmer, the severe climatic events such as droughts and floods, cyclones, hurricanes, wildfires, they are becoming more and more common and their severity is also further increasing. So, still a lot needs to be done. So, while we are talking about sustainable development goals and we are trying to achieve them, the government, governments across the world, they come together, they discuss, but still a lot needs to be done and very clearly now we know that climate change is human induced 
primarily due to burning of fossil fuels and release of more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, the first thing that we need to do is cut down these greenhouse gases. Very quickly taking you through some of the history events 1912 an article clearly describes the greenhouse effect that how burning of coal creates carbon dioxide. So, the discussion had been doing rounds since then and then UN United Nations played a significant role in bringing consensus amongst parties different governments on coming together and focusing on action for mitigating climate change for reducing global warming. So, it started from 1949 the UN scientific conference on the conservation and utilization of uh, resources it was formed and it addresses about the depletion of these resources. Further the economic and social council was formed and it was the, f the first to include environmental issue in its agenda as a specific item that was in 1968. 1972 we clearly already have seen UN scientific conference and for the first time the first earth summit was held in 1972. 1979 the convention on long range transboundary air pollution was adopted and the discussion on air pollution started to happen. In 1980 United Nations UNEP expressed concern at the damage of the ozone layer and after which Vienna convention was held in 1987 which discussed about the uh, protection of the ozone layer and they talked about uh, the conclusion of a protocol uh, that was again in 1979 which had happened about the transboundary air pollution further leading to the formation of IPCC a forum for the examination of greenhouse warming and global climate change leading to this one 1988 formation of IPCC led to some very important events declarations and protocols one of which was Montreal protocol which was on banning the substances that deplete ozone layer and Montreal protocol by far has been one of the most successful protocols by UN and IPCC and we have seen within our lifetime that we have been able to reverse the damage. The ozone hole which was a major problem it has now been fully healed because the world came together and we stopped using the substances chlorofluorocarbons or hydrochlorofluorocarbons which cause damage to the ozone layer. So, why I wanted to highlight this was because if we all come together it is possible to reverse the climate change too just like we have reversed the damage to ozone layer through adoption of adoption and also implementation of Montreal protocol. Along with that there were declarations such as Helsinki declaration again that was for ozone layer protection and then there was a Malay declaration on global warming and sea level rise. 1992 uh, the United Nations uh, conference on environment and development uh, happened and also there was an opening of the framework for signature that was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change UNFCCC which has become one of the most important instruments for uh, climate change action. Then in 1995 which was the follow up of UNFCC C, uh, that the first conference of parties that happened and that adopted the Berlin mandate. So, following UNFCCC several conference of parties which implies the parties which are party to UNFCCC they come together and they discuss the issue of climate change and they are all signatory to UNFCCC. So, everybody presents their progress what are they doing to mitigate the climate change and uh, all of that. And in 1997 which was one of the major uh, actions of UNFCCC and IPCC that the Kyoto protocol was put for adoption and that becomes in 2005 now from 1997 it took almost 8 years for Kyoto protocol to become an international law for those countries which have agreed to sign for it and there are significantly large number of countries which are party to Kyoto protocol. So, hopefully we will be seeing more action on climate change mitigating climate change and reducing global warming and just like Montreal protocol Kyoto protocol also becomes an uh, a successful uh, protocol. After 
1997 Kyoto Protocol, a lot continued to happen in 2007 there was a Bali action plan to extend the Kyoto Protocol after 2012. So, Kyoto Protocol target lines were set for 2012 from 1997. Now, in 2007 it was realized that not much has happened, not much success has happened. So, they extended the Kyoto Protocol beyond uh, 2012. 2009 there was a Copenhagen COP and it failed uh, miserably the, there were a lot of discussions on climate change, but it did not happen. Now, that is again an event which further took the cause of climate change and the discussion of it quite seriously. People COP came back in 2011 in Durban followed by 2014 in Lima, where the nations were invited to pledge voluntarily to cut down GHG emissions. So, individual nations were to set their own targets to cut down GHG emissions, set their own target dates, but people were invited to come over and present their pledges. Finally, in 2015 COP21 in Paris was uh, uh, organized and the universal agreement to cut emissions sufficiently to prevent earth's temperature rising by more than 2 degrees centigrade. Now, this was really heartbreaking that from 0 we are talking about 2 degree centigrade rise of global temperature. We have become so accommodative that we are kind of talking about agreeing to at least limiting the global warming by 2 degrees centigrade. We are close to 1.1.2, 1.3 currently and what we are talking about is that okay, it does not have to go above 2. We are still not uh, talking about 1.2 or even lesser than that. That is how accommodative we have become, but COP uh, so th there has been a lot of criticism around this adopting this particular uh, guideline benchmark. But at the same time, since we have been talking about sustainable development, the nations have a need to grow economically, socially. So, looking at all those concerns, this was probably the realistic target that we had set for ourselves and today we are talking about limiting the global warming to around 2 degrees centigrade. Now, coming to the last section of this particular lecture that is on SDG goal 13 climate action and I will also be talking about two more goals, but this particular goal SDG goal 13 talks about climate action. So, it has set five distinct targets. First one is to strengthen resilience and adaptive capacity to climate related disasters. Now, we have clearly realized that climate change is inevitable. The events relating to climate change are inevitable. So, we have to prepare our communities, we have to build our communities to be more resilient, we have to strengthen them to withstand the climate related disasters. So, we are able to uh, save our people and there is less and less loss in the communities. Second target is integrate climate change measures into policies and planning. So, while we are preparing ourselves to witness some severe events, we are still talking about having policies in place to reduce climate change. Third is to build knowledge and capacity to meet climate change again very similar to the first one here we are strengthening them on ground and here we are enhancing the capacity and the knowledge to meet climate change. The fourth uh, one is to implement the UN framework convention on climate change UNFCCC how it will be implemented uh, in individual countries is what we are talking about here and the last one is to promote mechanisms to raise capacity for climate planning and management. So, two parts to this climate action, one to mitigate, to reduce the impact severity of climate change and the second one is to build res resilience, to strengthen our communities to withstand all the impacts of climate change. Now, if you look at the implementation progress, in the last lecture I had clearly mentioned to you about looking at the implementation progress report. So, every year the UN Secretary General he presents an annual SDG progress report which is developed in cooperation with UN uh, system and individual countries. So, if we look at the climate action this goal number 13 we will see that we have not really done any good on this particular uh, target 
on this particular goal. In fact, energy related carbon dioxide emissions they have increased by 6% in 2021, which is the highest level ever. So, instead of dropping or even staying at par or staying at the point where we were, we have further gone up as far as emissions, carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas emissions is concerned. So, this is again alarming. Now, we are talking so much about greenhouse gas emissions being the central cause of climate change and a lot of damage that is happening across the world. So, the world has realized that we need to cut down on greenhouse gas emissions and hence today we also are talking about greenhouse gas emissions and how to reduce them and then we will further go into the protocol, GHG protocol. Another goal SDG 14 talks about life below water and one of the targets here is uh, rather indicators here is ocean warming that is directly related. So, we are talking about pollution and fishing and acidification and a lot of other indicators but one important indicator here is ocean warming which is directly related to the uh, global warming and climate change. So, a lot of fish stock is also going to aquatic life is going to get uh, impacted and very clearly we have to know that if the sea temperatures rise by 2 degree centigrade probably the entire aquatic life will get wiped off. The entire aquatic life will get wiped off implying our oceans, our seas are going to become dead. And this is a severe impact that we are talking about. The next SDG which is SDG 15 also relates to this life on land and a lot of these species, animal species, not just animal species, plant species, they are at a risk of extinction if we are talking about 2 degrees centigrade warming of the climate, warming of the planet. So, a lot of these animals and flora they are going to get extinct. We as humans might consume even more energy, more fuel to make comfortable interiors for ourselves, but these animals who are going to stay out in the open, they will get extinct and that will cause an imbalance in the ecosystems and overall imbalance in the, in the environment. So, this is what we are talking about when we say climate change. So, thank you very much for being with me here today in lecture 3 of week 1. We will see you for lecture 4 of week 1 tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much.